One thing that we have to understand is that this isn't about a doctrine. It's not about, we gotta, you know, we have to do all this stuff and follow all these rules. I mean, there are things that we need to do and that we need to believe. But the basic fath, fact of Catholicism is that it's not about a doctrine, it's about a person. And a person is Jesus Christ. And Pope Benedict said this all the time. He said, it's about Jesus Christ. So we're at the bottom of page 56, so join me in the baptismal promises. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Do you reject Satan? I do. And his, all his works? I do. And all his empty promises? I do. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? I do. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was born of the Virgin Mary, crucified, died, and was buried, rose from the dead, and is now seated at the right hand of the Father? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting? I do. God, the all-powerful Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, has given us a new birth by water and the Holy Spirit and forgiven all of our sins. May he also keep us faithful to our Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so we are now talking about the third, I guess, article of the baptismal promises, which is, do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord? And this is one of those lessons that I think some people go, oh, all we do is talk about Jesus. Well, since he's the center of our faith, that's probably a pretty good place to start. And, you know, we should be contemplating Jesus for the rest of our lives, not just, you know, a few hours in religion class or maybe occasionally on a Sunday at Mass. Um, you know, so, you know, we'll try and cover some things you don't know about Jesus, but, you know, we got to cover a few of the basics too. And so, um, there's a lot to this and, you know, we're going to try and cover Jesus in an hour, which even in here, I try, I combined two lessons into one, which was actually used to be three lessons into two. And that was still, we're just, we'd have just scratched the surface. So we're going to do the best we can. But the overall writing thing is, is our belief in Jesus Christ as our Messiah and as the one who came to save us. It's like the central belief in our faith, right? But it's, it's not about rules. It's about the fact that Jesus was there. So we don't, we're not stuck on this doctrine of, you know, Jesus did all these things, right? We are, we believe in Jesus, the person and what he did and came to do. And so that's the difference. And Pope Benedict's got a real famous quote, I think it's in here, that it's not about a doctrine. You know, our faith isn't about a doctrine. It's about the person of Jesus Christ. And so it's just, it's just really important that we don't reduce this down to just a bunch of rules and regulations that I have to follow. It's about Jesus himself and not just the fact of the things that he said, but about him as a person in our relationship with him. And so that's, that's what all this is about. That's what all this is trying to, to bring us to. And that, as confirmed Catholics, you know, you guys' job, I guess, if you will, is to take that to the next level. Right? And so over this time, we're going to give you guys as many opportunities as we can to experience and to encounter Christ. And so like our retreat that's coming up in, in a month and a half or something like that, two months, you know, the goal there is an encounter with Jesus. The goal there isn't just to do a bunch of stuff and occupy one of your weekends. The goal is to encounter Jesus. Okay, and that's what all this stuff is. Whenever we go to Mass, the goal is to encounter Christ, not to fulfill an obligation that I have to do this thing on Sunday and I got an hour, let's keep it moving, Father. That's not what it's about. It's about encountering Christ. And so always keep that in mind with all this stuff. It's about, it's about that. And so... What I want to do is I want to read from uh, Scripture. I want to read those two passages at the top of page 57. The first one is from Philippians, and this one should sound familiar to you guys. This, is, this shows up in the readings two or three, maybe four times a year. And if 
any of you have ever prayed the liturgy of the hours or been someplace where you are there, it probably shows up there about once a week. Um, but it's a really important passage, and it's uh, mine's on about page 1326. But this is Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11, and it says, Who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God, something to be grasped. Rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, coming in human likeness, and found human in appearance. He hum humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. And so that's Paul's kind of statement about who Jesus was. It talks about him being in human form, but that he was still God, which is, you know, just really, it's, it's too big of a concept to sit there and go, okay, I've got that figured out. Um, and then if you go back to John's gospel, the very beginning of John's gospel, John lays it out. And in one verse, he says this, and this is John's, John chapter 1, verse 14. He says, And the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us, and we saw His glory, the glory of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. So John's basically saying, we saw Him. We saw God. Jesus is God. And we spent, time, we spent three years with Him, and He proved it. And, and so he's, he's, this is His eyewitness account. And it's at the beginning of His gospel, and then He goes on through His gospel to talk about the things that they saw. And if you read John's Gospel, his has got some really detailed stories. Like a number of the chapters, one chapter is like one story. You know, whereas if you go into like Matthew, Mark, or Luke's, you know, they'll have four or five stories in one of their chapters. You know, and some of them are more detailed, but John goes into a lot of detail. Um, and part of that is because his Gospel was the fourth one written, so he didn't necessarily need to cover all the other stuff. He went into more detail. But his is one of them that we for sure know is an eyewitness account. Okay, Luke and Mark, you know, those were written down, and Matthew to some degree, those were written down by somebody that was like following around Peter or Paul or those different types of things. And so they're all true, but it's, you know, they're not necessarily all entirely a first uh, firsthand account like John is is supposedly. And so. Um, so this idea that Jesus is God is central to our faith, right? And, you know, I think sometimes, and I know for, I for a lot of years kind of went, okay, well, Jesus is God, okay, you know, you know, next, you know, what do I need to think about? But really think about that, right? And this is something that I, I've been thinking a lot about lately, especially because, you know, you see all this stuff that's coming out of like the James Webb telescope and all the detail they're finding, and it's like it is so incredibly... There's just so much there. It's like it could only have been put there by someone intentionally. It couldn't have just like, you know, just kind of splatted out of nothing. And then all of this complexity. You can't get super complexity out of total simplicity. You can't get something out of nothing unless that nothing was acted on by an outside force. And that outside force is God. Okay, and so just thinking about the fact that God who is in charge of all that stuff, became so small to become a human being. And in addition to that, became a, just a baby, right? A helpless child and was born poor. He, it's like he, he, became, he came from all this greatness to about as low as he could go so that we could identify with him and so that he could also identify with us. I mean, he created us so he, he knew what was going on. He could see it, but he, got, he in a way gets to experience it as well. Okay, And so... It's super important that we get our head around this. You know, Jesus is, is um, the most important person ever to live, right? And he's also God. And so, in the catechism, it's got, a, it's got a thing. I won't read the whole thing, but it says um, in 423, it says, We believe and confess that Jesus of Nazareth, born a Jew of the daughter of Israel at Bethlehem at the time of King Herod the Great and the Emperor Caesar Augustus, a carpenter by trade who died crucified in Jerusalem under the procurator Pontius Pilate during the reign of the Emperor Tiberius is the eternal son of man. Okay, and so when we hear that, sometimes we're like, why all the historical stuff? But what it's trying to do is it's trying to, there are people that deny that Jesus actually ever walked the earth. 
Okay, so what this is doing is this is placing him in a time and a place, um, you know, where Jesus actually was. And there's, there's not just the Bible. There are other historians. There are Roman historians. There are Greek historians that can attest, you know, they'll give histories of Jesus. There's actually, I think, somewhere like a letter of Pontius Pilate to Caesar kind of giving him a report of what happened, you know, with this Jesus guy, okay? And so, so we have to realize that he really did exist and he really does live right now. And so that's, that's central to our faith because there are people, like I said, that will try and deny even the fact that he existed, okay? And so, um, you know, the emphasis, like I said, is that Christianity is not a doctrine, it's about a person, and that person is Jesus. Okay, so he existed. There's no question about that. And anybody that says anything different just isn't educated about it, okay? They haven't really taken the time to go into the details. Okay, so at, at the very least, we know he existed. Okay, so now, you know, then, then you could start to debate the other, the other things. You know, was he God? You know, were the miracles? You could start to debate that beyond that. But if somebody's not even willing to admit that he existed, that's a problem. Okay, so we need to place that, place him in history. And so we also, we, we believe and understand that Jesus was fully God and fully man. He wasn't like some weird hybrid, like he's half human and half divine. He's 100% human and 100% divine, all merged into one. How does that work? I don't know. Well, you, I think one, we'll die someday and we'll go to heaven. We're we'll like, oh, it's so simple, right? But right now, it's like it's something that we can contemplate. And so he fully experienced everything he did in his divinity and in his humanity all at the same time. You know, that that's a really difficult concept because he's the only one that we can say that about. So we don't have any other real point of reference. This, this hypostatic union that it's called, right? This 100% divine and 100% human. Okay, we don't have anything. So we just have to contemplate that and, and realize that since we know that's true, we can kind of work in that direction. Okay, rather than trying to prove it or disprove it, we just say, okay, that's, that's been revealed. And so now we have to kind of figure out how am I going to get my, start to get my head around that. And so, so sometimes I think, though, that when we start to think about Jesus and we realize he's so huge, it's like, I don't know where to begin, right? I, where do I start with that? And, you know, and I think sometimes that can be a little debilitating, right? Especially if we don't know what's going on in the Mass. We don't, you know, I can't read this whole book, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And so we kind of start to, you know, maybe step back from it because, like, it's just too much. It's too big for me. And so one thing that we have to understand is that this isn't, about a doctrine. It's not about we gotta, you know, we have to do all this stuff and follow all these rules. I mean, there are things that we need to do and that we need to believe. But the basic fact, fact of Catholicism is that it's not about a doctrine, it's about a person. And a person is Jesus Christ. And Pope Benedict said this all the time. He said it's about Jesus Christ and it's about our relationship with him. Okay, and not in some sort of weird little, you know, he's my best friend, kind of stuff like that. But in getting to know, through getting to know things about Jesus, we get to know Jesus. And we can only do that through things like scripture, right? And study and taking time away. Like when we do our retreat in a few weeks, we're going to take time away and we're going to let Jesus work on us. We're going to let the Holy Spirit work on us. I, I'm a believer in this and I've heard it by other people that every Catholic should take a retreat once a year just to reboot, okay, some sort of retreat. I mean, that's, that's why we take vacations, right? But our vacations become these things that take on a life of their own, right? We go to Disney World, and we're more tired when we get done than when we started, right, or something like that. Um, and I'm, I'm the poster child for that. I take backpacking trips, so that's a lot of work, right? But I still try and find time to regroup and relax. But, you know, tr taking time away and setting time, setting time aside is critical, for this, and so that's why a retreat is an important part of preparing for confirmation, because it starts to get us into that habit of preparing ourselves, okay, and setting setting time aside and letting the Holy Spirit get us when we're outside of our normal lives. And so, um, again, getting to know Jesus, this idea of an encounter with Christ, and you guys have probably heard me say this before, that's critical because if if we don't have an encounter with Christ, if we don't somehow you know, yeah, and it's not that we have to have this mystical experience necessarily, but just just a time where we have allowed 
God to work us. It might be as simple as going and spending 10 minutes in the church and sitting there and just being silent. It doesn't have to be something where I'm praying a bunch of rote prayers or I'm reading something or whatever. It can be just sitting in silence and just letting, letting God work on you. You know, you, you basically like, okay, Jesus, I'm here. You know, help me understand you more. I don't understand how that's you in there. Help me understand that. And just making the time. Making the time is the best way to do it, okay? And again, making the time, whether it's scripture or it's, it's study or it's mass or maybe some daily masses or a retreat or whatever it happens to be, making that time, okay, is huge. That's the way you're going to take steps in your faith. All right, so we are going to read Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. And again, it's going to sound super familiar. We probably hear this scripture maybe five times a year in Mass for one, one celebration or another. And this is um, it's going to sound real familiar. And this is from Luke's Gospel. It says this, verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And coming to her, he said, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at what was said and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of David his father. And he will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. But Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I have no relations with a man? And the angel said to her in reply, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, Elizabeth, your relative, also has conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her who is called barren, for nothing will be impossible for God. Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. And so there, the angel Gabriel, is, is, he's basically giving a rundown of who her baby is going to be and what he's going to do. And so um, she, she knows that this is going to be the Son of God, which you know, for someone who is probably 14 or 15 years old to agree to this was a pretty big leap of faith. Um, but Mary does it. Um, and, and um, you know, thank goodness she does. Um, and speaking of professions of faith, if we go to Matthew chapter 16, and this is verses 13 through 20. It says this, When Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter said in reply, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus said to him in reply, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly father. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly ordered his disciples not to tell anyone he was the Messiah. And so this is after a time, probably a couple years, of the disciples following Jesus around. And they've seen lots of stuff, and they've witnessed lots of things. And Jesus says, all right, who do people say that I am? And, you know, they give them a bunch of wrong answers, right, because they, they don't know. Um, and there are probably some that maybe have an inkling that he's the Messiah. They know he's a wonder worker for sure. But Peter says, you're the Christ. You're the one that, that God has sent. And so, um, you know, that's, that's where um, Jesus decides, okay, you guys are ready now. You're ready to hear, 
you know, what I've got to say. And so he starts laying out his plan of what's going to happen next. And if, if you know the geography of the area, which most of us don't, Caesarea Philippi, they had gone quite a distance away from Jerusalem, and they had been kind of, they had been kind of not chased away, but the but Pharisees and, and the, the, the Jewish hierarchy, they were kind of looking to put Jesus to death. So they kind of went far away for a while to let things cool down. But Jesus at that point says, okay, now that you realize who I am, I'm going to go back to Jerusalem and I'm going to be tortured and, and crucified and, and then I'm going to rise from the dead. And so he's basically saying, here's what my mission is. And, you know, this is, this is kind of shocking to them. And so, I don't know, depending on what mass you went to today, I know Monsignor Holmes talked about this today. Today was the transfiguration. And the transfiguration was six days after this. And, you know, the six day, it was a six-day journey to get to the mount where, the mountain where he did the transfiguration. But one of the things in the transfiguration is, okay, he's already told them, I'm going to be crucified and I'm going to be taken from you. And so what he does is he takes them up in the mountain and they see lots of things and there's lots of different um, interpretations and, and things, you know, this, the fact that it's Moses and Elijah, one's the law, one's the prophets, and Jesus is uniting that and fulfilling that. But one thing that Jesus is doing, he's like, I'm showing you what my glorified body is going to look like. And so he's saying, all this, I said all this stuff's going to happen, but in the end, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be alive. And so he's, he's bringing them up there to, to kind of help them to the next level, but also to kind of comfort them, to kind of say, it's going to be okay. Okay, you know, so just, you got to trust me that, you know, because Jesus knew that if I, if I spell everything out, there's no way we're going to comprehend it. Just like now, if Jesus appeared in his true form up in the church, we couldn't comprehend it, right? If he gave, and he gave us all the plans, um, it, would be, it would be too much for us. And so that's one thing the transfiguration is for. But previously, in what I just read, the apostles are showing, okay, we, we understand what, who you are now. And so that's important. And that's what we have to get to, right? But they have to take it on faith. You know, Peter kind of said it, but, you know, was Peter, like, totally convinced? Or did everybody kind of go, I don't know, what do you say, Peter? You know, because we don't know. Or we, we're too afraid to say it. You know, you almost get the feeling that they all kind of looked at Peter for him to kind of say what, what the answer is. And he does. And so, so this, this profession of faith is really important. And so that scripture verse is a really good one to meditate on because we always have to ask ourselves the question that Jesus asked them, the second question. Who do you say that I am? Right? He says, who do, who do people say that I am? That's fine, but who do you say that I am? And that's something that we have to continually ask ourselves. Who do we say Jesus is? Right? Who, you know, is he the Lord of my life? Is he just a miracle worker? Or, you know, whatever. But we need to ask that question of ourselves constantly and say, how, is, how does that affect our lives? Jesus only reveals certain stuff to us at certain points in time. If he revealed everything, it would be too much. Our heads would explode. And so he gives us what we need when we need it. And sometimes we don't, you know, we want to know more, but we're just not ready to digest it. And so that's what's going on here. And so, so this is the point where then they start heading to Jerusalem and Jesus starts making his final march toward his passion. So that's why we heard the transfiguration the other day. It's kind of like the beginning of the end. We're moving, we're moving towards Jerusalem at this point in time. And so one of the things with that is... Um, this book right here, um, The Wonders of the Holy Name of Jesus. I would be willing to bet that most of us hear the name of Jesus in an, in an inappropriate manner more often than we hear his name in an appropriate manner. Um, I know I worked in secular jobs for probably over 30 years, and I definitely heard Jesus' name used as a swear word more often than I heard his name honored. And we have to, if, if that's a problem, and, and I was... I was one of those guys, right? Because that's what my friends were all swearing every other word, and that's, that's who I was when I was a lot younger um, because that's who the people were that I hung out with. And so, but then I realized that it's really important that we don't use God's name in vain or Jesus' name in vain. It's not just, it's not just a bad habit. It's like it's a mortal sin, and it's a really bad habit, and we need to break it. And so this book, and I've got copies. If anybody wants to take one, they're welcome to have one. But this, um, this Wonders of the Holy Name, um, it was written in like, I don't know, 1946. So 
you know, the guy that writes these little books, you know, the one that he wrote, he's the same guy who wrote the one in the mass that I gave you. Um, he's pretty direct, as you'll remember from that book. And in there, he says a couple of really direct things. And he says, the divine name of Jesus is in truth a mine of riches. It is a font, fount of the highest holiness and the secret of the greatest happiness that a man can hope to enjoy in this earth. It is so powerful, so certain, that it never fails to produce in our souls the most wonderful results. It consoles the saddest hearts, it makes the weakest sinner strong. It obtains for us all the kinds, all kinds of favors and graces, spiritual and tempor temporal. Two things we must do. First of all, we must understand clearly the meaning and value of the name of Jesus. Secondly, we must get into the habit of saying it devoutly, frequently, devoutly and frequently, hundreds and hundreds of times each day. Far from being a burden, it would be an immense joy and consolation. And so, you know, when I was out working in the secular world, every time I'd hear somebody use God's name in vain or Jesus' name in vain, I would like dig my fingernails into the palm of my hand. And one of my jobs, it was so often, I actually wound up just taking my rosary cross and digging it in the palm of my hand because it seemed like every other word I heard was a swear word using God's name or Jesus' name in vain. And so, but we can have a profound effect. Um, the last job that I had, um, my boss, he'd sit in his office and it was always GD this, and JC that, and it was just like constant. And I didn't feel like I could go in there and talk with him about it, but I just prayed. I felt like that was all I could really do. Um, and he knew, right? I was wearing my crucifix. He knew, you know, what I was about. And I remember one day he was, he was in there, he was super mad about something, and he was like, GC this, and all of a sudden he stops, and all of a sudden I hear from him in his office, he goes, sorry, Steve. And I had been praying for this guy for a long time to realize what he was doing. And he realized that he needed to stop swearing. Maybe he, didn't, he should have done it to realize he was offending God. But at least he did it because he realized he was offending me. right? But he was my boss. And he was like three levels above me, my boss type of thing. Um, but that prayer seemed to help. And so you know, maybe that's why I was placed there for him to have that realization. I don't know. But it really gave me an appreciation, more of an appreciation for the name of Jesus. And so what we need to do is, is when we're in a situation where we don't know what to do, it's just say the name of Jesus. You know, what he's recommending we do there is just say a one-word prayer. Just say the name of Jesus. Because the demons flee at the name of Jesus. And as we read in Philippians, every knee must bow at the name of Jesus. Okay, And even, even the devils have to bow at the name of Jesus. And that's why they flee, because... They don't want to bow at the name of Jesus, but they're, but they, in a way, they're obligated to. And so, just saying the name of Jesus, or Jesus, I trust in you, or Jesus, help me, or something like that. But saying His name devoutly, that's a prayer that gets answered. Okay, it may not be like where, where suddenly everything is better. Maybe you have to say Jesus' name a hundred times, or maybe you have to say it for months in a row, right? But you will, you will start to find solace in that. Okay, and so saying the name of Jesus devoutly um, and asking things, like I said, Jesus, I trust you is a great one, right? Um, but this is a really good book, and there's, there's examples from the saints of them saying the name of Jesus, and it gives other benefits of, of praying to Jesus. It, it, it's just a really well-done book. Um, and so take a copy if you're able. Hopefully I have enough for everybody who wants it. If not, I'll get more um, because I want to get these things in your hands. I, th I told you guys about that daily devotional I was reading. There's another one in here, that, that one called God Calling. Um, I don't read it anymore, um, but I, I was reading it one time, and there was a, one in there that talks about the name of Jesus. And so if you look at the bottom of page 59, that's in there, and it says, My name is the power that turns evil aside, that summons all good to your aid. Spirits of evil flee at the sound of Jesus, spoken in fear, in weakness, in sorrow, in pain, it is an appeal I never fail to answer, Jesus. Use my name often. Think of the unending call of mother made to her children, to help, to care, to decide, to appeal, mother. Use my name in the same way, simply, naturally, forcefully, Jesus. Use it not only when you need help, but to express love, uttered aloud or in the silence of your hearts. It will alter an atmosphere from one of discord to one of love, it will raise the standard of talk and thought. Jesus, there is none other name under heaven whereby you can be saved. 
And again, um, you know, sometimes I think a familiarity with Jesus makes us think like, okay, what do we, you know, I've learned a lot about Jesus. Why do I need to learn more about Jesus? But we should spend the rest of our lives trying to learn more about Jesus and trying to encounter him. And if we ever start feeling like that, um, you know, realize that, that God is always trying to draw us closer to himself. And by sending his son Jesus, he gives us a visible sign of who he is and gives us a glimpse into his own heart. So, um, go into your discussions with a real open heart to uh, discussing Jesus today.